Welcome back, everyone, to another episode of the Nest Podcast. This is episode number eight. I appreciate everyone joining. Uh, so, a bit of background for today. This this idea kind of came to me uh, a, f- a few weeks ago, and I was I followed this this individual on Instagram, and her name is Philly Fleming, and she was using I, I know she was using some bands you know, around her arms, around her legs. And I was like, what, like, you know, what, what are those? So I sent a message and I was like, look, like, I noticed you're using some bands around, you know, your arms. Like, what, what the fuck is going on? What, what are those? Um, and turns out there's something called BFR bands, which is what we're going to be talking about today, which means blood flow restriction. So it turns out that is a thing. I didn't know that was a thing, but it is. So quickly, what is so, Philly, thank you for thank you for the uh, for the inspiration, which was completely not clear. Like, definitely, it, it wasn't intentional. But thank you anyway. So, what is um, blood flow restriction? And uh, if you haven't had a guess, but well, about what it is by now, or at least what it involves, then I recommend you go see a, a doctor because I think I think you might have a few issues. So it has got to do with exactly what it sounds like. It's got to do with restricting blood flow to um, the muscles being worked. It was firstly studied in 1998 by Dr. Jeremy Loenik. I believe I'm pronouncing that right. I don't know. He's Canadian. Uh, however, it originated in Japan back in the 70s, uh, which I cannot remember what exactly they called it. However, there was a certain... Um, I think it had lots of A's in it. That's all I remember. So its purpose is to fully occlude or block uh, venous blood flow to that uh, area of the body. Now, bit of background anatomy and physiology, super basic. It will block venous blood flow, not arterial, meaning blood going to your limb will be fine. That's your artery. Your artery takes blood from your heart all the way over to the muscles, okay? So oxygenated blood is going over to the muscle. That's fine. We don't we don't have an issue with that. That's cool. However, the vein is what returns it back up um, to the lungs to get oxygenated, then goes into the heart. Uh, I, I, believe I'm, I believe I'm saying that right. My mind's kind of frazzled, but the vein does return it up to the heart. Artery takes it away, A away, and uh, the vein brings it back. So what you end up having is you end up having a bunch of blood pooling where the muscle is. Now, that sounds unhealthy. You know, you you always got taught, don't kind of be upside down for too long because blood will get stuck in your head or whatever. And, you know, then you also see when people... Um, have blood flow cut off to their limbs they start kind of going blue and all that kind of crap however as we still have arterial blood flow your tissue is still receiving oxygen now let's go on to what traditional hypertrophy or hypertrophy looks like i got i got picked on a lot because i say hypertrophy um when it should be hypertrophy but regardless so the majority of research suggests that you need to use the equally or over 65% of your one rep max for hypertrophy. So let's say, for example, someone who can bench 200 pounds, ideally you want to be working with 130 pound upwards. Or equally, if you bench 100 kilos, you want to be working with 65 upwards. Now, um, how does hypertrophy actually occur okay before that actually no before we go into that let's just talk about what the hell hypertrophy is because some of you might be listening for the first time if so welcome muscular hypertrophy is the increase in diameter of the muscle as well as an increase of the protein content within the individual fibers so diameter of the muscle fibers we spoke about these last week um and obviously the the protein content within those as well. So hypertrophy occurs one in three ways. Um, we've got 
mechanical tension, number one. You've got muscle damage, number two. Finally, you've got metabolic stress, number three. Now, we're going to be focusing a lot on that third one, um, but just a little bit of background information. You've got mechanical tension, which is basically heavy lifting, um, and your body basically adapts to the stimulus. That's number one. Number two, you've got muscle damage. Okay, so this is what causes a lot of delayed onset of muscle soreness, so DOMS. This is what you tend to feel the next day. So this is when eccentric, um, well, both concentric and eccentric parts of the, of the, um, of the lift do muscle damage. This is where um, micro tears occur in your muscle. Micro tears, as we spoke about last week in, the, um, in episode 7 to do with steroids, um, any form of micro tears, protein comes in, fills them up, kind of makes, increases uh, the diameter of the muscle as well as the protein um, content. So muscle damage is, is very good. Bodybuilders tend to, to really enjoy that kind of, they, that's their, that's their go-to. So that's the, the second method. Just quick note, um, concentric does less muscle damage than eccentric movement. So eccentric is when the muscle's lengthening. So for example, on the bicep curl, it would be the downward motion. On a squat, it would be, well, for a quad, it would be the downward motion. Um, for a bench, it would be the downward motion. You, you, see what I'm, you see where I'm coming from. Whereas the concentric, the pushing upwards, um, results in less muscle damage so that's why they always say time under tension is king uh now third one and arguably most important metabolic stress so this is where the pump occurs all right the, the legendary pump now <clears throat> what metabolic stress is caused by is high reps with short rest periods okay so for example you're doing a bicep curl I'm just going to go there because it's the easiest one ever, the easiest exercise to use because everyone knows it. You're doing a bicep curl. You've got it on, say, 65 to 70% of what you find difficult and you're blasting reps out nonstop, okay? You stop, you take 30 seconds of rest um, in between the sets and then you go back on it. What this does, um, basically, when, when the muscles continually contract, uh, a blood pooling effect is created within the muscle. Uh, so this then restricts blood flow, which leads to hypoxia. So when that happens, metabolites such as lactate, not lactic acid, lactate, build up and cause, cause an anabolic effect, leading to molecular signaling um, and increase in hormonal response within the body. That is a very sciencey sentence. Let me just break it down for you. Lactate, also known as lactic acid, but it's not the same thing. But for now, let's just say that it is. So the lactate builds up within um, your muscle. And then molecular, basically your body tells, uh, your, your muscles tell your body to produce um, certain hormones. Okay. So. This is like, again, that was, that's, that's putting it super simple. We're about to get into a little bit more, little bit more fun. So we talked about lactate. What is lactate? This is where the science kicks in. All right. And Meg will agree with this. I went through my lecture notes for this shit. So this is, this is where it gets, this is where it gets a little bit sciencey. So what is lactate? Uh, lactate, we also Quick, sorry, before I carry on, YouTube, if I lose you again, I'm terribly sorry. Um, my camera just hasn't been enjoying my company the last couple of weeks. So we'll just, well, hopefully it doesn't, but just in case. So what is lactate? When we exercise, there is two methods of exercising. Well, not really. There's, there's quite a few. Um, so you've got anaerobic which is without using oxygen, and then you've got aerobic. Those are the main two. And then from there, you can split it down into ATP and all that kind of stuff. So lactate is a byproduct of anaerobic glycolysis, which is when your body breaks down glucose to use as, um, as energy. 
So, glucose releases two molecules of ATP. Okay, now this is very important. ATP is, again, spoken about this before. It's the, uh, like basically the, the, the body's currency of energy. Okay, so glucose produces two ATP molecules and it turns into pyruvate. Now from there, pyruvate turns into lactate. This is where lactate comes from. It's very important. From here, lactate. So this is, this is happening all within, within the muscle, right? This is within the muscle. From there, lactate goes back up to the liver through the veins. Important shit here, through the veins where it is turned kind of back into, it kind of turned back into glucose. And then it repeats itself. So how does BFR work? Uh, and how does it how does it kind of jump in with this whole lactate shenanigans? So quickly, blood flow is only cut off to the muscle. Okay, it's not cut off anywhere else. It's not cut off to your fucking legs if you're doing a bicep curl. All right. Um, so yeah, quickly quickly point that out. Pulls metabolites around the muscles which leads to to pretty much there's no there's no recovery where there's so the lactate is just stuck where the muscle is okay you the, it's just it's it sits there 30% of one rep max is more than enough to cause a hypertrophic response but we'll get to that later on i've got studies you know me i love a good study and lastly there's just a few quick points uh this is acute you must not restrict your muscles for hours, all right? We are talking minutes. So maximum, maximum, absolute maximum, I would say about five minutes. That's too much. If I could, I would have it on for a set, finish a set, go again and again and again and again. So I'm not talking about having a full-blown fucking workout here with that on if you do that you're an idiot <laughs> quite frankly um but we'll 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 go on to that we'll go on to that a little bit later okay now how does it actually work well uh i don't really know how to call conrad conrado conrado de freitas et al back in 2017 um found out that it actually works very similarly, extremely similarly actually, to how metabolic stress works. Okay, so it basically blocks vascular return. Um, it increases uh, metabolites such as lactate, phosphate, uh, inorganic phosphate, and hydrogen ions. Now these then go on to cause hypoxia, hormonal release, cell swelling, and there is an increase in reactive ox uh, oxygen species. Now, I'm aware that not many people will know what reactive oxygen species are, and that's fine. Neither did I. That's what I'm doing at uni. Now, before we get onto that, I quickly want to go on to the hormones because this is this is the important side of things. Okay, um, so with the hormonal release, it releases four hormones which are very important to note down okay so these guys uh mr de freitas et al um did uh, a little a little study and they looked at people who were doing bfr versus people who were just doing high intensity resistance training the guys that were doing bfr were doing low intensity um so approximately 30 percent of their one rep max whereas the others were doing 70 80 that kind of thing i believe now, they saw a growth hormone increase of 1.7 times greater than the increase in the high intensity group and then the high intensity group compared to the, to the control, which were do, just doing low intensity. So they saw a 1.7 times increase greater than the high intensity group, which, which had already had an increase over the low intensity group. 
it, you get where I'm coming from here. So you've got low intensity group, let's just say for, for, for argument's sake, that they found an extra one centimeter in diameter, okay, of, 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 of biceps. High intensity would have found, let's say, a hundred times, a uh, hundred, yeah, a hundred centimeters in diameter. And then the low intensity BFR group found 170 centimeters in diameter. So that's kind of the scale we're looking at, right? Those aren't the exact numbers. I'm just giving the scale here. Um, IGF-1 saw a significant increase, which is insulin growth factor, insulin-like growth factor one, I believe. Uh, yeah, IGF, insulin growth factor. Yeah, correct. Saw an, a significant increase. mTOR1c saw an increase. I, I, I can't exactly remember what this uh, hormone does, but that saw an increase. I remember it's got to do with um, cell signal. I can't remember exactly. Um, and it also st saw a down regulation of myostatin. Now, this was in both groups. So this was in the intensity, high intensity, and the BFR, uh, low intensity one. So myostatin, basically what, what this does is it inhibits myogenesis. And myogenesis is what we like to see. Myogenesis is the new formation of um, muscles, basically. Um, we went over this last, uh, I believe it was last week again, where we saw that um, increase in testosterone will increase your myogenesis and then you need satellite cells to, to give over their, their nucleus, if you, remember, if you remember. So it inhibits myogenesis and myostatin was down-regulated, which means that it was not inhibited so inhibition would be for it to be completely like shut off almost. It was mildly, it was reduced. The action of it was reduced. That's the easiest way of putting it. Now going back to the reactive O2 species, what are they? Are they good or are they bad? Well, it depends. That's, that's, and, and I hate giving out this answer because everyone's like, oh, what the, what the fuck does that mean? Well, <sighs> Okay. Simply put, reactive O2 species can be, you don't, you don't want too many of them, but you don't want too little. Um, so they're kind of very similar to, to, you know, everything in moderation. So if you are already high in a reactive O2 species, then I would not recommend you doing this because going any higher could possibly injure you. However, if your um, production is normal, and you don't have any issues, and trust me, if you had any issues with, with O2 species, you would know about it by now. Um, so, if you are low on them, feel free, go ahead, um, do it, and if you're, again, if you're in the middle, go for it, do it. Only if you're high, don't do it. Now, as we said, the hypoxia, all that kind of stuff, those were the causes. Okay, so, what did these lead to? Okay, so that like the they were the byproducts of um so the hypoxia hormonal release, cell swelling, um, reactive O2 species production, we those are the kind of results of, of blocking vascular return. Now what do those lead to? So we got angiogenesis. Now this that is a hell of a word. Angiogenesis. It means the production or creation of new blood vessels from pre-existing blood vessels. Um, not going to lie to you, I did not know this was even possible until I was doing my research for this. It, mitochondrial biogenesis, uh, which means basically putting it in, in, in normal people terms, it increases your mitochondrial mass. Um, those who do not know mitochondria, you know, back from GCSE science or the powerhouse of the cell. Um, so those uh, increase in mass, which, we, which is good um, for, for, well, anyone who wants more hypertrophy. And obviously, finally, muscular hypertrophy. Didn't really need to tell you anything about that. You knew this was going to happen. I knew it was going to happen. Um, so yeah, that's kind of, that's what, 
this guy found with his with his buddies uh, doing the research on it. So it increases metabolites, uh, which therefore cause hypoxia, hormonal release, cell swelling, and all that kind of stuff. And then that leads to new blood vessels, increase in mitochondrial mass, and increases in muscular hypertrophy, which, again, we love to see. Now, I think I need to cl- quickly clarify a few of these things, um, because as soon as I heard about about BFR, I instantly thought of it as like a fucking, basically a wonder drug, okay? But it wasn't really a drug, it was like a wonder training method. Don't think that makes much sense, but we'll go with it. So, answering a few questions, you might be thinking, you know, how often do I use this? How much should I, how much uh, pressure should I cut off? Like, you know, what, what, what are the metrics here? Okay, so not enough research has been done on how much you should cut off. So don't go basically tying it up until you feel your hands falling off. Um, Because it probably will eventually fall off if you do that. Should it be used in substitute over high intensity? The answer to that is no. Um, It should be used as... Think about it as a tool in the toolbox, okay? You've got a hammer in the toolbox. However, whenever you need to screw a nail in, you don't fucking smack it with a hammer, do you? That would be stupid. So you use it in in moderation, okay? Um, where When would this be very useful? So the first... Um, time that this was used in the Western world was for injuries. So they looked um, at, you know, people people doing this for, I can't remember when they were, I can't remember exactly where they were doing it, but they were doing it somewhere and the guy was like, well, if they can use it for this, then I can use it for someone who's struggling to get their strength back, right? So for example, there's actually a video out there, I can't remember which basketball player it is, bloody massive he's like seven foot something um i think it was seven foot something um and what they did is i think he had he had a he had some form of injury i can't remember whether it was it must have been soft tissue injury but he had a soft tissue injury and instead of putting him back into weights where he would be squatting you know i don't know he he couldn't squat his normal one rep max for obvious reasons there's an injury there So do you just sacrifice strength and lower the, um, like the injury of risk? Or do you just say, fuck it, we'll go as much as we can, increase the injury risk and kind of minimize hypertrophic, uh, sorry. Oh, what was it called? Basically, uh, muscle loss. Would you increase the risk of muscle loss for an increased risk of injury? So this doctor turned around and he was like, well, if these guys are using it, then surely I can use it for this bloke. And he did. So he basically, he strapped um, uh, a a cuff around his legs and he put him to do, I think it was cycling. I can't remember. I'm pretty sure he made him do cycling on a recumbent bike. Now, what he did is he put it down to 30% of what he normally would do. So 30% of, of his one rep max. That sounds fine. However, this guy was struggling. He was struggling really bad. Um, so, having said that, considering the fact that, you know, you've seen that this has got similar effects to high, resi- high intensity, I reckon this could be, I reckon this can be pretty much the new thing for, for, for rehab. I genuinely believe, I, I thoroughly believe that, you know, if, if more research could be done on this, I think it's the next, bi- the next big thing. Um, so it's mainly, it should, it, it can be used um, for injury rehab as lower loads are required instead of, like, let's say if someone's got a 200 kilo squat, they can do 60 and still be out of breath. Like, you know, the, the, the risk of injury is so much lower, it's, it's kind of a no-brainer. Now, how 
low should your rest be? Um, and again, you know, this people will tell you that, you know, it depends on your goal. If you're doing a hypertrophy, there should be no more than 30 seconds to a minute. If you're doing strength, they will tell you there's, you know, three minutes or two minutes minimum and crap like that. When you're doing BFR, it shouldn't be less than 30 seconds because at that point you're kind of, you're increasing, not increasing the risk necessarily, but you are, how do I explain this? You're increasing the time that your veins are restricted, okay? Um, now, although we'll get onto the safety of this in, in, the, next, in the next kind of little chapter, if you will, um, I do not believe that you should be doing any more than 30 seconds rest. Um, or around that period anyway. Now, going back to the tightness, research has actually found that higher pressures, and, and by pressure I mean the compression, are not better. Um, I believe they found that you should be roughly around 80% of your, of your uh, blood pressure. Okay, so it's still allowing flow, um, or at least a, a, it's still allowing arterial flow, should I say, when so obviously arteries are a little bit more um, hidden in the body. The veins are a little bit more um, artificial. Artificial? Is that the word? Can't remember. But basically they're a little bit more on the outside. I can't remember if it's artificial. I, I, I don't think it is. But I always forget that word. So we'll just go with artificial for now. Now, let's go back to the whole is it safe thing. And I've got I've got quite a few studies for here, so there's there's been a decent amount of um, of research done in terms of you know is it safe? Does it show any kind of long term damage or anything of the sort? Going back to what we were saying earlier, the American College of Sport Medicine recommends that weight training is at seventy percent of one rep max in order to achieve substantial hypertrophy. All right, seventy percent more than or equal to seventy percent of one rep max. So. When you can achieve the same levels of that hypertrophy with 30%, how much, what is the drawback? So this study uh, did done by, I can't pronounce the name, Loanique. I'm going to just go with Loanique. Um, et al. back in 2010 covers a few things. It covers blood flow, blood coagulation, which those who do not know it basically means kind of like blood clotting almost. Um, Oxidative stress, nerve conduction, velocity, which is how, like, is there basically any form of negative repercussion on your nerves? Um, a lot of people have been worried that because you're cutting off blood supply, that that will affect your nerves and, and you know, not enough kind of, I, I don't know, that or compression of them or anything. Um, so let's have a look. And then there was also a van, van, van. I can't say this. Van Wy? Van Wee. I'm going to go with Van Wee in 2017. Um, and the only thing that I found there was blood clots um, that was worth commenting on. Everything else was kind of commented on by Leonique. So what is what did Leonique find in terms of the effect on blood flow? Now, Leonique is, he's been, he's been the, the, the grandfather of this, all right? He's the, he's the, he's the grand uncle, the grand whatever. He is the godfather of this stuff. Like he's been studying it since 1998. The guy knows his shit. So what did he find in terms of blood flow? Um, actually, this, this really shocked me. Um, he found that it actually responds in a similar fashion to normal exercise. And as I thought about this, I was sat there, I was thinking, you know what? How on earth does it respond similar when you've got a cuff around it tightening pretty much every every other second so how i didn't understand that so i was really i was like how how the hell does it work but then as i thought about it more i was like well you know metabolic stress i guess has got the similar effect um so if you compare bfr to metabolic stress then you're it's pretty much the exact same thing um Granted, you know, there's a few a few bits that, that aren't that aren't similar. For one, you don't really have an external source applying pressure, but the pressure is there nonetheless. 
whether it's internal or external. So, yeah, the blood flow, basically blood flow, nothing out of the ordinary. Um, blood flow around the rest of the body was absolutely fine. Um, now, blood coagulation. Coagulative activity saw no increase following low-intensity BFR. Um, now, this is going to be a very... Uh, I might trip myself up saying this this um, this word, and you guys might laugh, but it's fine. Fibrinolytic potential. Fibrinolytic, fibrinolytic. F-I-B-R-I-N-O-L-Y-T-I-C, all right? Potential, increased. So what this is, it basically means that the... So, fibrinolysis is the breakdown of blood clots, basically. Um, so, fibrinolytic potential means that the blood clot prevention inc potential increased. Blood clot prevention potential increased. <laughs> hell, of a, hell of a long word, but fibrinol fibrinolysis, as we have said countless times in the past, um, lipolysis, you know, uh, glycolysis, always mean, lysis means that something is broken down. Um, so fibrinolysis basically means that blood clots are broken down and it just it minimizes the risk of them, basically. So fibrinoly fibrinolytic potential um, basically just prevents blood clots, um, which is good. We love to see that. I don't want a blood clot. I don't want to die of a fucking stroke at the age of 22. So, now, coming up next, we've got oxid oxidative stress, okay? Um, now, this, I, I wanted to make sure that I knew exactly what this was um, and what oxidative stress is, is that it is an imbalance of free radicals within your blood, uh, which leads to cell and tissue damage. And we don't want that, okay? Free radicals aren't, they're not great. They're not great at all. We don't like free radicals. I remember doing them in my first year at Plymouth University. It wasn't enjoyable. Hated them. Learned to hate them. So these things lead to cell and tissue damage. Um, there's also a few, th if I remember correctly from my years, my year in Plymouth a few years ago, they're also... I believe, don't quote me on this, but I believe they also have a role playing in cancer. Um, however, going back to, to, to now and to this, is there any increase to oxidative stress? And the answer is no. Although there is, and this is this, I, I really need to stress this out, although there is little research around this, there is no increase, or at least it saw no increase. More research on this would be great. I'd love to see it because, you know, you don't really want to be banking on a couple of papers um, <laughs> because that shit is dangerous. But the, it didn't see a big increase. It actually saw no increase in those few bits um, of the research. And then nerve conduction velocity. Again, you know, there's there's been concerns regarding nerve damage with BFR. Uh, whether that is because of the compression or because of the limited blood flow, I don't know. But there has been uh, a lot of concern uh, surrounding this area. And I'm glad to report that there's no chronic, no chronic effect found um, on NCV nerve conduction velocity. That's basically the velocity at which your nerves fire. Um, now... V's are chronic, uh, so it is not acute. What uh, Mr. Lewinique said is that any future research would be beneficial if they did look, look if they did look at the acute effects um, of, you know, BFR on NCV. And I completely agree. I think it would be, I think it'd be a, a really, really good thing to ha have a look into because if there's any acute effects then that could possibly lead to any longer term effects that Mr. Leonique might have missed out on um so what did the other guy find in terms of blood clots and I, I really like this because they th you'll see why I liked it 
they went really in depth. Okay, and this is the one thing that I was super glad that I found because they've got data from 13,000 people. Um, and by the way, this 30,000, 13,000, my bad, all utilize BFR. So all of them utilize blood flow restriction training. Um, and we saw, they, we saw, I'm, I'm not, I didn't conduct the study, but they saw quickly, uh, quickly patch that one up, but they saw that there was an increased, uh, sorry, there was an increased risk of um, basically deep vein clotting, venous thrombosis, uh, or arterial blockage in the lungs, pulmonary embolism. However, the, increasing, the increase in risk of these two are less than 0.06% and less than 0.01% equivalent. So deep vein clotting, you are looking in one in, how many is this? This is six in a thousand, I want to say. So you're looking at roughly six in a thousand. If my math is not wrong, you're looking at roughly six in, no, six in 10,000 on one of them. And then you're looking at one in 10,000 in the other. Um, so this is like the, 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 the risk of this is seriously low. Don't get me wrong, it's not like one in a million, which would have been great, but regardless, it is still a very low risk. Um, so looking at this, I'd say the safety of BFR, again, I am no doctor, I am in no way a professional, so do not quote me on this if you suffer some form of, of side effect please, I don't want to get sued. There is minimal, there is minimal, there is minimal risk. I said there is minimal there about three times, but there is minimal risk. And I would personally, with the research behind it and how much I've looked into it, I would, I'm actually looking into doing, into trying this method of training, whether it's once or twice a week, um, I, I'm not, I'm really interested in it. Um, so yeah, so Loanique, again, our favorite little godfather looked at low intensity BFR and he said, um, what he said is that you should only be doing it two to three days a week maximum. Um, so two to three days a week, maximize adaptation. And he said that instead of giving it like a whole day, Let's say I do my a push day. All right. Let's say I do a, a a push day. So chest, shoulders, and trice on Monday. Classic chest Mondays. So if I do that, what he said is utilize BFR. So let's say do your triceps that day as well. However, only do a couple of exercises, and again, low intensity. Because you, you you physically won't be able to lift high intensity. Um, you might be able to for the first rep, maybe. Um, but following that, it will hit you like a bloody truck. So whether you do or whether you, if you do go on to use um, BFR training, then don't go for any higher than 30 to 40% of your one rep max. Um, because you, you physically will not be able to, you physically will not be able to exercise at that rate. Um, you'll feel the burn way too quick you, and you physically, you will not have the strength. Um, so quickly going back to what I was saying, utilize BFR. Let's say you do chest, shoulders and tries one day, you do your biceps yeah, so if you do chest, shoulders, and I, I just realized I cocked that up earlier. If you do a push day, so chest, shoulders, and tries on a Monday, utilize BFR on your biceps for two exercises and let's say for three sets on each exercise. Um, of course, take a break between that. So let's say you do one um, exercise, you take them off, let the blood flow, um, and then following that, Either you put it back on uh, and just go straight into the next set and then you'll be fine. 
again please for the love of christ do not because i've i've seen i've seen a lot of um not studies but i've seen a lot of online forums where people are saying oh you know i left it for the full workout and i've got this and that afterwards i'm like oh well, no offense mate but if you left it on for the full thing you're kind of a dickhead <laughs> like if you're if you're literally stopping blood flow going back up for a full hour what do you do you expect anything good to come out of that shit no you're a moron um so yeah for the love of christ don't be stupid stupid um so let's just summarize this podcast up in a nice little in a nice little 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 way that we always do how what is bfr bfr basically takeaway points what is bfr bfr is blood flow restriction training which basically means that you block venous return to the heart of a certain muscle group okay following that what does this do this causes a few adaptations so increases metabolites such as lactate hydrogen ions or inorganic phosphate it causes the muscle to undergo hypoxia which increases hormones such as growth hormone IGF-1, mTOR1C and myostatin. It leads to an- angi- angiogenesis, so creation of new blood vessels. It increases the mass of your mitochondria and leads to muscular hypertrophy. Now, where was it that I saw that there was a study conducted that looked into both of these methods? And they actually found that they had extremely similar, um, so people who used BFR on low intensity had extremely similar results in terms of hypertrophy in comparison with a group that had high intensity. So much so that they classed the increase as non significant, which means that. That the, there's there's pretty much no difference between the two, which was which was significant. Um, however, you get you're achieving that with low intensity, so it's 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 a it's a really I I find that it's a really good um. I found that it was a really good study because it shows that low intensity with BFR can achieve high intensity results. Again, what can this be used for? So this can be, number one, used for if you have an injury. It could be used for rehabilitation. It can be also used just to complement your training, right? your week-by-week training. Is it safe? Well, at the moment, research hasn't shown that there are any safety concerns that are of kind of extreme, you know, concern. Um, so at the moment, research hasn't shown anything that is, that there's a large concern for. Again, as we said, one in like 10,000, um, would, would, sorry, six in 10, one in 10,000 would have pulmonary embolism and six in 10,000 might have, um, deep venous thrombosis. So in terms of safety, it seems to be fairly safe, um, Obviously, don't worry, your your um, blood pressure might go up a little bit during um, during your use of BFR. However, you will you'll tend to see that 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 also happens with normal with normal training. Um, heart rate will go up, you know, blood pressure will go up. And actually with um post occlusion blood flow will also go up with both so most of most issues um that people are worried about there is a minimal risk of it or there is no evidence of it i will include a picture on youtube at this point where i'm talking right now of um it's actually the it's it's from um the study by loanique in 2010 so you can see here that 
all of the effects such as stroke volume, NCV, muscle damage, blood pressure, heart rate, fibrinolytic potential, coagulation activity, oxidative stress, and or oh, I'm out of breath, and post-occlusion blood flow, um, all are on here. So feel free to screenshot it um, and, and have a look. But is there any risk to it? In my head, not particularly. Uh, there has been, as I said earlier, there's been no significant risk shown. So in my head, that's perfectly fine. And basically six in, in 10,000 people, is, uh, those, those risks are fairly low. Um, so again, just before I head off, um, yeah, it's, it's, it's been, it's been a pleasure once again, uh, speaking to you guys and talking about BFR this week. I hope you have found this useful. I hope you found, you've taken something out of this, you've plucked something out of this lovely little garden of information I've given you, and you're going to put it, you're going to frame it, you're going to put it in a glass or a vase or whatever the ha- whatever have you. Um, and, and yeah, please uh, do not ask me where you can get these from because I've got zero clue. I've seen a few on wish.com, which I would really not bloody recommend. I've seen a few on Amazon, um, which, which they're, they're, <sighs> There's some of them which have uh, some, I, I would trust the company, and there's also one company which they're extremely good, but they cost like 180 quid. Um, so yeah, don't splash out 180 quid just to get a little bit more of a pump. However, thank you for joining. I appreciate it. Uh, next week, we will be talking about hypoxia and altitude masks. Okay, you know, there's little things that went like viral a few years ago and everyone was wearing one when they were doing cardio. Yeah, we're going to be talking about those and we're going to see how much of an impact they actually do and if they're worth the money. As well as, what does hypoxia do to your body? Now, thank you for joining. I'll see you all next week. Have a good rest of your week. Goodbye.